your platform to share my experience to you. Uh, uh, I have reversed uh, my experience, how we have done the uh, earthquake resilience uh, community during that, uh, during that very important and very needed time. So, uh, I have prepared some slides and I will show you. Uh, basically, uh, we have done the uh, whole work during the past uh, two years, uh, completely volunteer, 100% uh, volunteer. That means that we haven't get any uh, monetary uh, value from the government or the, some NGO or the NGOs. These work are completely voluntary, 100% voluntary work. So, uh, I would like to share some of uh, how we have done the uh, voluntary work during that period. So my uh, slides contains are the information, uh, grievance handling during the disaster and redesign of the community after the disaster. So here is the uh, first slide. We show the information that is the hustle bustle. So we have the information during the disasters, all the information are hustle bustle. Means that uh, lots of people are uh, trying to know what is happening, uh, numbers of the uh, house collapses during the earthquake. And uh, also the uh, uh, want to know the casualties at the certain places. So uh, lots of people are uh, want to know and the want to help the uh, community. So so these are the uh, information we got the first day of the earthquake. Then after uh, these are also the information that lots of lots of people are afraid of to uh, sit on homes and the. Uh, uh, their nearby places. So they left their homes to uh, open places and uh, some of uh, are trapped in the debris. So some of are trying to rescue the, uh, uh, these are the victims. So after all, uh, after all, uh, after second day of the off week, that means uh, uh, off week happens at the so uh, Saturday. So Sunday morning, uh, me and my friend, Sosis, we need to uh, collect the data that is in the ocean. Uh, it is actually the ocean we have printed, uh, and uh, uh, we are doing the ocean work at the Kutipur uh, uh, that is non funded by any other. So we are just motivated to do work for our town for the uh, heritage work. So these uh, these um, images show that the, the red red circles are the collapsed houses, the rock collapsed houses. We took at the Sunday morning. Then after that, we tweet at the tweet about the our status of the uh, house collapses and also on the Facebook and our uh, official page, our Kirtipur. So then after there is lots of information and lots of uh, communicate between us how to help us at that moment, at a very moment. So then after uh, we map again. This is the temporary shelter mapping. So how the displacement. How, uh, how there is a uh, displacement of all during the earthquake. So the, there is the green, green, uh, green are the displaced uh, shelters which are the affected by the earthquake. So we map uh, this one and again tweet about this one. Then after the Wednesday, after four days, we got the first response from the uh, Butwal. Uh, the youth from the Butwal came to help us. They uh, give us the uh, relief material. First, they found that they found the tweet and they come out to help us at the Wednesday, a very, a very early morning. So after that, uh, we again map at a print that uh, how the uh, how many people are there in the shelters. So uh, there are there are some. I put roughly 20 trains uh, about 50 people. Which is at the uh, open places and another. There are lots of people uh, outside of the, our town. In fact, I would like to share that uh, Kirtipur is the most affected during the uh, earthquake. Whole this is uh, Kathmandu Valley. Kirtipur is the most affected. Among that, Panga, which is my place, it is the most affected. Our uh, casualty number is 16 number. But the total casualties are 45. Among 45, we have 16 casualties and lots of uh, uh, victims also. So then we map, we again tweet, and we again share to the, our friends to need the help. So okay. <laughs> then after we map, 
in this way, the uh, physical conditions of the house is. So, I need to be fast. <laughs> okay, then uh, we have learned that, that uh, displaced family mapping of um, their, how, how the clusters of the displaced families according to the, this map, which helps by the KU and the DJI and the P40, they help us to map this one. Then after, uh, these are the few normals. <laughs> Sorry, I have to be fast. So, uh, these are the few numbers of uh, how we rescued, how many numbers of rescued and first aid the, uh, during that uh, period of the very important period. Okay, then after uh, we, uh, I want to uh, relate this map to the management. So, how we manage that uh, mapping to the grievance handling. I will show again. Uh, these are the uh, effected. We have the uh, 1334 households in our panga. Among that, 43 percent are damaged, completely damaged. It's a huge number. So that is a, a we again research that how many uh, within a ward, how many are affected completely, and then we manage to uh, find out the how the type of the houses. So these are the figures of the types of the houses. Uh, we have the old houses, new houses. Those new houses are also the collapse, and the old houses are the most effective places. So then after, uh, these are the uh, figures which shows that uh, displaced patterns of the families. So some of the families are the, uh, uh, they went to the relatives' homes, some of are the uh, went to the uh, rental, and most of people are went to the fields for the shelter, that is temporary shelter. These are the figures. Then after the grievance handling, how we uh, handle the, that uh, grievance. So, during that uh, period, after mapping, we found that the patterns of the peoples and the uh, scatter of the people uh, throughout the Panga Valley. So, uh, CDMC is the number one at the period that we, uh, we managed to figure out how we can deliver that thing and uh, travel in during a uh, very fast period. So, after that, uh, relief ma materials, lots of people voluntarily come to the, the give us the food materials during that period. And then we went every tent, every tent, we never left any tent. We went to the tent and give them properly manage the whole relief food materials. Then after, these the medicines. Medicines also, uh, uh, I think, we have a, or that uh, one road policy, but uh, that time the government is not working properly. So, uh, so we are working hard to uh, distribute the uh, medicine also. So, <laughs> so very fast. This is the government received money. Okay, I I see this one also. Uh, how we work? Uh, first period of this uh, after the second days, uh, we train to figure out the mapping process. So first slide and. We discussed panel decision and all other things and we trained the Amazon world to uh, extract the details and we frequently uh, meetings for how to uh, grievance handling. So these are the Morphe photos. Uh, so we found the best, uh, best CDMC means uh, Community Disaster Management Committee. We, we are the best committee in that whole area. We've done the best thing. So, uh, uh, after that, for the redesigning, uh, building back, rethinking, and the replanning, we have to think, uh, think how to build back uh, quickly. Uh, so uh, this is the 3D map of the our uh, syndrome, okay. syndrome uh, panga. That is the last thing. So we are uh, really inspired by the Pilache pattern. Pilache is the uh, Pilache is doing good job that time. So we are so moved by them. So we. Also, uh, trying to copy their idea. So, then after uh, we designed this one uh, to show the public how we can build that damaged house after the collapsing. So, this this is the proposed choice of facade of joint houses, loss of uh, new house houses, joint houses. So, we try to show them, convince them that these are the choices. You can uh, do the RCT or you can buy the Mordric. So. But the facade should be the symmetric wise, so the new agriculture should be the uh, prism. Okay, then uh, these are the challenges. Uh, main challenge is that uh, we are doing 100% volatile, so uh, lack of the money we cannot do further work. 
Secondly, and the, due to the state government, there is a lack of the state government. Till now, we also know that the state government is not open properly. Uh, sorry, that's the name. Okay, recommendation. Uh, we should have the human mind and the human heart to help the communities. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susma, for being very cooperative. Uh, you can have a seat. Um, thank you for highlighting um, the work, wonderful work you have done so far um, and the one you have planned. I think the Pinashe project was um, also initiated by um, uh, Dr. Sony Morgley and other yeah, team, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Uh, we have another very young, uh, dynamic, uh, open data advocate um, and also the CEO of Open Knowledge Nepal, uh, Nikesh Palami. So I'd like to invite him for his presentation. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, so hope you are having a good time and thanks for the and congratulations KNN and OpenStreetMap team for bringing this awesome event in Nepal. Uh, so in my presentation, I will not be talking about the OpenStreetMap but the whole uh, open data movement. And I'll be highlighting a couple of uh, open data projects run by Open Knowledge Nepal and Code for Nepal Collaboratively. And where we have used small, small parts of uh, open map data uh, like leaflet and map access, etc. Uh, so, as Gordon mentioned, my name is Nikis Palami and I represent Open Knowledge Nepal especially and sometimes Code for Nepal also. Uh, so, as the presentation says, uh, so we are non profit organization uh, like every other who is representing here. And we specially advocate uh, uh, citizens and government to use technology and uh, technology and advocate uh, for the most technology and we develop, a new, develop new tools uh, which are suitable for government, which are suitable for university students and others. Uh, uh, so maybe uh, since we are uh, most of the tech guy and geeks uh, in our community, uh, in our organization, we uh, build tools differently. And we advocate for um, this whole open data ecosystem for Nepal. Uh, we advocate for government, we advocate for civil society, and we, speci we specially uh, develop tools for uh, citizens. Uh, and and we, we definitely want to be part of this movement of uh, open data movement in Nepal. And uh, we, we do not push government for just for data policing, but, but for the right policing. Right? Uh, we, we, maybe we ask government to publish it in machine different format, we ask government to uh, publish it completely. Uh, maybe uh, we ask government to follow the whole structure, uh, the right structure to publish open data, data only. And as, um, these are the principles that we specially focus for advocacy, not for the tools. And yeah, um, as an organization, we are representing an organization, we love advocacy, uh, technology and the team, young team that we have. Uh, almost all of you in our uh, organization is pretty young. Uh, maybe uh, I'm the, one of the senior guys in the organization. <laughs> uh, uh, and we have different tools uh, like, uh, and not just for my data, since the community is especially for my data, but uh, we as an open knowledge community, uh, we work in different aspects of open data, like we work for budget data, we work for election data, we work for uh, uh, like this open data handbook. Uh, content data, open education data. Uh, so we we try to capture different uh, uh, open data aspects of Nepal. And yes, we have since uh, we, we we are one of the oldest community uh, running maybe last uh, last four years. We have developed lots of tools and uh, different communities in Nepal. And yes, uh, since the, uh, just to just to make sure that uh, 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 this presentation is a little bit related to map uh, data map. Map also, so I am just trying to connect, uh, uh, trying to connect a little bit in data plus map also uh, and uh, trying to talk a little bit about the uh, couple of projects that we have, uh, uh, we have been doing in the park. Uh, so this is one of the popular projects uh, that we have been running uh, for the last couple of years. It's called Nepal Map uh, So, uh, So in Nepal Map, uh, since uh, just for this visualization we have been uh, using open system map and but, uh, but for uh, showing this demographic data, education data, election data, uh, so you can uh, see all these uh, data in visualized format which are good for students, which are good for researchers, which are good for journalists, uh, for uh, data journalism, 
so this is one of the good tools uh, that we have made that we have been advocating and uh, that we have been uh, making good uh, day to day day. And this is one of the recent project that we have done. Uh, it's called Election Nepal. Uh, so we, just, we track all these uh, uh, local election data in this portal in open format, in most machine readable format. Since Nepal government uh, do never publish their data in machine readable format, and we just want to uh, uh, cross this archive of journalists uh, to access data through this portal. And, uh, and one of these. Uh, since the uh, in last year, uh, in, in the recent panel discussion, there was a solid development also. Since uh, they promised that they had published all this uh, solid data, but uh, maybe, uh, but for this reason, but uh, before that, uh, uh, we did one of, the, one of the cool project, maybe, maybe cool project, yeah, so that uh, when, when we publish different administrative boundaries of Nepal, you know, uh, safe files of Nepal in open format. Uh, and yeah, recently the solid development also published it. Uh, but because the uh, tech guy and this journalist were solving this uh, project uh, uh, recently very fast that we developed this project also and and for this, uh, all these CFR this can be very much coolly integrated in this open map also since uh, the backbone of all these projects are map of map data uh, open issue map data and this is the one of the projects we are trying to connect to with the open open map. Uh, it's called public bodies. We, since we have all this data for, for different uh, different public bodies, uh, contact address uh, and this uh, the different kinds of name and address uh, of in the list. But uh, what we recently trying is doing this. We, we are trying to integrate this data in open map uh, so that it can be a different projects uh, so that um, uh, not just information but uh, users can find this. Uh, find this uh, where the public body is located through the maps and uh, get the directions of all these things. Yeah, and uh, through this uh, couple of projects, thousands are taking direct benefits. Uh, the students are using it, the journalists are pretty goodly using it, uh, and uh, maybe government are the part of our users group, uh, but rest of the others are pretty using it. But but maybe yeah, I am saying this like this is the cool projects that we have ever done. Uh, but what we are lacking is uh, we are lacking the clarity and innovations. Uh, we have to connect this like the uh, we have this data because the theme for the conference is also like this creation to use. Uh, and like we have created lots of data and what we are trying to figure out is like how to use this data in the right way so that everyone can take benefits. Uh, indirectly and directly also. Uh, so we are we are just uh, tossing the different youths of Nepal uh, to brainstorm new ideas for the innovation and clarity. And because we also believe that uh, uh, many minded principle and fixing it faster with open data. Uh, couple uh, couple of projects of open data, open data Nepal are built overnight also because we have lots of tech guys uh, working online or possibly print activity. Uh, the the idea of fixing it faster, like uh, sometimes uh, the the vulnerability is that our side has having uh, directly pull request by uh, maybe uh, some other guy from different parts of the world also. And because this was a past scenario of Nepal, and the Nepal is now in this scenario, uh, uh, the, the data are, the digital data are slowly getting out in the PDF format. But the future is right here in the visualization, interactive visualization. That's all. We are trying to, we as an open community, we as an open source community trying to solve and uh, try to move forward with this uh, visualization kind of thing. And that's the, that's the things we as a community uh, produce this. And that's all come to us together, we will make the better society not for us but for everyone. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's all for our presentation. Wow, wonderful time. But what I like most about you Seriously, your energy, man. <laughs> like he's everywhere. When it comes about open data or open data advocacy, like he'll be there. Um, I always think like he's very young, but not. I mean, we are similar in the age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, similarly, um, I didn't have time to give more lecture from my side, so I'm just a facilitator, and I would like to connect without any delay. Uh, Mr. Sumit Duver, uh, he will.
thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. So it's uh, been a year since uh, we as an organization at Practical Action, we've been using uh, OpenStreetMaps in our uh, community-based work. So speaking a bit about Practical Action, well, uh, we specialize on community-based flood early warning systems. And a year back, we had conversations with uh, Kathmandu Living Labs on how we can sort of use OpenStreetMaps to sort of enhance and inform our work on flood early warning systems. And I guess the work that I'm going to present uh, reflects that. And, and this is a joint and collaborative effort of uh, the team. So it's IASA, Practical Action, KLL, and a local NGO, CSDR. So what's the demand? So basically, if we look at the theories and uh, the Sendai framework for DRR, what is actually required is people talk about data, but then what people really lack is use, using that data, making decisions using that data. And I guess the theme of the conference, I guess, sort of echoes well with what we're trying to present here is we have the data, but how do we use the data? We have a lot of data, but how can science sort of inform policy and how can science be used? make critical decisions. And the focus of my presentation for the next nine minutes or so is, be, is going to be centered around floods. And the idea of sort of using OpenStreetMaps occurred to me during uh, the floods of 2014 in the Karali Basin. So after a huge flood, what we really want to know about is where are the safe shelters, how many communities are impacted, where are safe drinking uh, water, raised hand pumps, so forth and so on, and other roads accessible or not. But then, when we go on the ground, uh, what we really find is, uh, you know, there are helicopters flying around, but they really don't have an idea if they can land in an open space or not, because the data is not there. And this project uh, that we did was based in the Karnali Basin, where we work with more than 74 communities with our local NGO. And then our effort was not to map uh, in Kathmandu or map internationally, rather we wanted to train the local NGOs, train the social mobilizers, who don't have any education or any expertise in mapping. And we were surprised because a year back when we did the training, they were efficient, they were capable, and they were able to map their own communities. So the work uh, in the next seven minutes or so is going to sort of uh, show that. So, and, and obviously just uh, to, 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 uh, to, to deliver a point is that we talk a lot about uh, global data sets, but we sometimes miss the, miss the point of, you know, how uh, with global data can be used to make local decisions. Uh, so, and and the, and if you've heard uh, of this or not, there is also this tool called participatory vulnerability and capacity mapping. So, communities they are also responsible for making maps. So, they also have the skills and expertise, and with help of local NGOs, they also make maps in a chart paper. So, they have these maps in chart papers. But the problem is, after a project gets over. These maps are destroyed, maybe is in uh, somebody else's drawer, drawer or maybe in some laptop. So these data are sort of siloed and, and doesn't speak to each other. So what we tried to do was that we sort of tried to bridge the gap, made sure that these data, the data that communities collect, but not replace this process, is sort of entered in open street maps. And then uh, this is the evolution of participatory mapping. We have ground mapping, sketch mapping, transact mapping, scale mapping, so forth and so on. And then we tried and used an integrated approach. And our pilot was the Karnali Basin in uh, Western Nepal. And obviously, as I said earlier, the, the motivation to do this work with Kathmandu Living Labs and, and other colleagues was the floods of 2014. And it was very heartening to see that even yesterday, like in EC mode, uh, more than 20,000 buildings were mapped in areas that we flooded during 2017. So this is the pilot in, in, in the Karnali Basin where I mentioned earlier we trained local uh, NGOs in using QGIS, in, in using JOSM, in using OSM. And then we sort of went to the field, we sort of collected data, we sort of ground validated data. And, and now you can see, like this is the figure that I guess most of the slides uh, today have used. And you can see uh, in, in, in the area of Rajapur, not even a single place was mapped you know, few, a, a year back, but now you can see it's, it's very rich. You can see there is a bridge, apparently there was a bridge, it, the bridge connects the islands uh, of Rajapur to Kailari. So, but this is not it, I, I guess uh, the more thing was that it was a collaborative effort where we trained the local NGOs, they went to the ground, they sort of collected the data and we were very, uh, I guess, uh, fortunate that we were able to get that localness in OpenStreetMaps 
For example, I want to know where is a safe shelter, how many safe shelters are there in the Karnali Basin, how many safe uh, drinking uh, hand pumps are there, you know, what is the road condition, how many schools are there, how many health posts are there. I guess this sort of local information cannot be achieved by mapping remotely, rather going on the ground and sort of doing ground validation. That's when we get the data. And our, uh, our effort was to train the local NGOs, to train the local social mobilizers, such that they also get the skill that they can further use in their careers and in the field of expertise. And then, as you can see, more than 50,000 buildings and 100 plus kilometers of road, uh, roads have been mapped in half a year. So, you know, a year before we did this training, and I guess with remote mapping and also with ground validation, we've been able to achieve this. And it's not been uh, a sort of a single effort. It's been an effort by a lot of colleagues, a lot of individuals sort of working together as a team. And then, uh, this is uh, one of the maps uh, in the Karnali Basin. So, I would like to sort of take some time in sort of presenting this map. So, this map uh, was, we've made more than 50 maps. 50 maps, and this tells us, you know, what the exposure is in communities across the Karnali floodplains. And, and the sort of information we have is farmland, forest, buildings, raised hand pumps, toilet, health posts, safe shelters, so forth and so on. So, how can this map be used to sort of make decisions? If there is a local government, then he or she wants to know that how many houses are there next to the floodplains? How can land use, be, you know, how can land use planning decisions be made? Uh, for example, if there is a flood event, how many safe shelters are there in the Karnali Basin so that people can take refuge? So we were very interested to sort of have that data in OSM and have that data in the map. And what we are trying to do in the next month or so is we plan to take all these maps to the communities, to the local NGOs and sort of validate, ask them what do they think about these maps and if there is an opportunity we want to update it in local language, in Nepali. And this is uh, the location of safe shelters uh, in the Karnali Basin. So this sort of gives a spatial distribution of the safe shelters uh, in the Karnali Basin. And as I said earlier, we want to sort of scale it up in the Karnali Basin and you know in other river basins uh, in Nepal. And this is uh, sort of a very techy uh, map that I've shown, but just to add some uh, uh, sort of story towards it. So uh, here what we are trying to use it is sort of we have results from science. We know that uh, if you run flood models, we know what the flooding scenario might be when you know there's certain uh, water level or rainfall falling in the upstream. And we know, we, we know that you know how many houses might be sort of inundated we know how many utilities might be might be impacted during a flood event. So what we've done is we sort of used the science, we sort of overlaid in OSM, and then we know how many houses, how many buildings might be inundated if there is a flood event. And I guess by this, what we can know is how many houses are impacted, but what is the water level? If the water level is, you know, 0.5 meters, if the water level is 1 meter or 2 meter, we can actually find statistics on how many houses might be impacted if there is a huge flood event. So I guess I, I guess this equals really well with the frame, I guess, from creating to use. We're trying to use scientific data, we're trying to overlay in OSM, and what we really want to do is we want to talk to local government and such that they can make decisions based upon these. And then, I guess this sort of supports in the overarching uh, theme of building disaster resilience, improving human and social capital, building relationship with local stakeholders, local government, and making sure it's an inclusive partnership, and also support better land use planning and management for natural and physical capital. And in the end, uh, just to say that we are very privileged that the work that we did, and that we started a year back, we were sort of able to, uh, rec we were able to get global recognition in the global uh, DRR platform in Mexico. So this is, uh, I guess, sort of the work that we did together and uh, I guess uh, I'd like to end uh, by, uh, right now. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations, uh, Sumit and the team for the award. And uh, it's been a privilege working with you and I know how excited you are and how much um, energy you have for the people and also um, 
capacity, lo local capacity of the people is not a um, small tax and the way you are engaged with the Karnati project and other um, projects and the use of open street map is always appreciable. Thank you very much. And uh, similarly, I would like to invite another inspirational person. Uh, I'm saying inspirational because he's another volunteer uh, who has a wonderful story, I'm sure. Um, after Yogeshi, I think there is some connection with the presentation as well. So I'd like to invite Sir Sis Morrison. He's also from Lalitpur. So the floor is now. Uh, namaste everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting about our OSM activities in, at Kirtipur. So, how many of you have been to Kirtipur? Okay, many of you. So, how, what things do you remember about Kirtipur? What thing do you remember about Kirtipur? The painting. Painting, yeah, the rectangle. Any other things? Or other things? Maybe Lahana? Yeah, Lahana. Lahana, right? So most of the people and when we are, whenever we ask about Kirtipur, they remember Tribune University or Lahana. So what we think, right, Kirtipur is very historical town. It's uh, like a founded in the 11th or 12th centuries, you know. And so it has many historical aspects, but still people don't know about Kirtipur much, right? So. So, and in Kathmandu, Bhaktipur, Lalitpur, there are many historical places and most of the tourists go to Kathmandu, Lalitpur, Bhaktipur, but no one goes to Kirtipur because people don't know much about Kirtipur. So as a youngster, as a youth group, what we thought that, what would be best, uh, what would be best method to tell people about our place? So we found out that Open Street Bank might be the best tool to say or to make our place visible to other people or all people from all around the world and also people from other parts of Nepal. So this is just a, a whole aerial photograph taken in during, nine, uh, during 70s. So you can see it's a very old Dewar settlement. And how did we start? We started with youths from Kirtipur, local youth. So this was the first training we conducted at Kirtipur uh, Panga. So people are making some kind of mind map or some kind of map, hand-drawn map. So you can see people are using candlelight. So there was no electricity. So one of the major challenges for uh, digital mapper like us. So we had like a closed group Facebook page. We didn't want much of the spam in our page. So we created like a secret group or closed group for communication with each other. And we started with Josom first, like digitizing buildings and road first. And also like in other first, in the first very first mapping, there are very less participants, but in later on, the participants increased, and we jump on to the Josom then. So we found that, sorry, jo, we found that Josom was a bit difficult, so we jumped on to ID later on, and we, the space was given by like uh, one of the school there. And like youth, they get bored with the same thing. If we work with them like the same tool, they get bored. So we, uh, in a, after like a, we were doing this each Saturday. So after doing uh, mapathon for like two weeks, we went to the field to collect different uh, data. So our focus was rows, especially rows and uh, place name with a local name. Right now, like uh, uh, people are forgetting local names right for the places. For example. Like a place named Toga Opi is now this Nagal Dogato, or Omansi is now Nayabaza. So people have forgotten old names. So what we try here, we try to uh, try to you know uh, tag the place with the old name, or not like popular name but older name as well as popular name too. So our target or our uh, focus were in a uh, roads and place with local names, and also public open spaces and mostly heritage sites. So if we talk about Kirtipur, we know about Bhagavata or Uma Maheshwar temple, but there are many, many other heritage sites. So we try to digitize them and try to collect their information. And other maybe water resources and medical stores. These were our focus first. So this was the status when we started in 2013 or 2014. And later on, we, uh, we managed to digitize most of the uh, most of the heritage sites only from a big temples to small street shrines and all the 
stairs to the uh, Kirtipur hill and all the small, uh, bigger roads to smaller roads. So if we compare to Google, uh, Google map and uh, OSM, now you can see, uh, you know, you can see in Google map there's like Neva Lohana is more highlighted, right? So it's the most popular Neva restaurant in Kirtipur. But in uh, OSM, you can see most of the uh, heritage sites and most of the ponds and open spaces have been digitized. So we were in the field, like in 2015, April uh, 25th, it's an earthquake, right? So Saturday, it was Saturday, and me and Yogis and all the people, we were just preparing to go to the field to validate the results. And Yogis was waiting for me outside, and suddenly the earthquake, uh, you know, struck. And we were, after the earthquake, we were more focused on, uh, like, rescuing and uh, disaster management aspect rather than uh, mapping things. So in the 2015, you can see there's a spike in a uh, spike in a like you can see there is a very spike like number of many uh, number of users who are digitizing open street mapping fields. This is a similar data for Kirtipur. We can see uh, we can see like uh, a lot of people digitize buildings in Kirtipur after 2015. So this is an example like how people from all over the world they digitize the building, but you know, I just give this example, like how, why like a remote mapping uh, should be you know, collaborated with the local mapping effort and local mapping community. So this example, for example here, you can see cluster of buildings, but they have, you know, very long buildings. And we went to feel if there is a real building or not. And we found that those are all tunnels, right? They're all tomato tunnels, not the buildings, but they have been tagged tag as a building. And also here, the security works, and also here we can see very long buildings, long buildings. So they are only small, small buildings only, right? Not the long buildings like in a red circle. So we can see like there, there are millions of buildings has been digitized, or thousands of buildings of it have been digitized in Kirtipur alone, but there are some issues uh, while mapping it remotely, right? So I just wanted to highlight these uh, things here. So till now, 331, Contributors, maybe there are like many of you also who contributed uh, digitizing Kirtipur, and among them, 37 were local mappers, and and more, uh, 19 local mappers were active more than one day. And in 2017 alone, uh, like there are eight active mappers, like who map one or more than one day. So there is his motivation for still local mappers are still motivated to contribute in OpenStreetMap because Google Street. Google map, they don't have much data. And one of the friends who is digitizing say, we could get information of different places at the same time. And we could update the place and rules we know. The important thing is we could feel all the of the data we feel and have a feeling like it's ours. So I think like the people who, who are on the ground, they are really motivated and want to contribute to this opposite map, uh, opposite mapping, uh, uh, opposite mapping. And challenges for like local mapping or like us who who doesn't have like an external source or more resources is like internal bandwidth. Like for example, here in this mapping event, we are using a uh, saw like this electronic saw who has got beautiful or who has got very huge uh, bandwidth for internet and also like poor satellite imagery and tagging guidelines for local entities is a challenge for local mappers. So in a way for I want to highlight like. We should communicate with local mappers like before and after remote mapping for like validating the projects. Like for example, I saw you like there might be some errors in digitizing buildings or roads. So we can collaborate with local mappers to validate them and also be, give them constructive feedbacks to new mappers so that they would encourage, you know, they would be encouraged to do more mapping activity. And also like you know, we can encourage local mapping parties rather than you know centralized mapping parties. And thank you. I would like to uh, thank uh, all the members who contributed for creating map for Kirtipur. And also I would like to uh, thank these two organizations in Kirtipur who helped us during our mapping activities. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Sir uh, Sisi. It's always great to hear a volunteering story, and thank you for sharing your wonderful story. Uh, last but not the least, we have flying guy. So he's gonna talk about drones and whatnot. So I would like to invite Uttam Purasani. He is the executive director of Nepal Flying Labs, and the stage is yours. Thank you, Pradeepai, for your kind words. Yeah. Uh, the same name was given to me by my program coordinator when I was doing bachelor's in geomatics in Kathmandu University uh, because I have been working on with uh, drones and frontier technologies like VR and this kind of things for last three years. So in my presentation, I will be talking about uh, the drone industry in Nepal, like how uh, drone started and drone activities started happening in Nepal and Ultimately, I will try to link it with how drones can be used uh, to improve the accuracy of open state maps and how we can be benefited from it. So, as you all know, Nepal earthquake 2015 was a huge tragedy uh, to our beautiful country, Nepal. And after the Nepal earthquake, there were lots of uh, national and international organizations coming into Nepal uh, doing uh, volunteering as well as supporting the relief and reconstruction activities. And most of these agencies, uh, they started coming uh, and taking the pictures of the damaged buildings and damaged surroundings, but not with DSLR cameras and terrestrial cameras, but this time they started coming with uh, drones so that they can have a better perspective of the level of damage that has happened in the community. So this was actually a good thing because uh, the drone imagery gives you uh, a true estimate of the amount of damage in the surrounding. But on the same time, what happened was that there were uh, many different individuals uh, who like randomly flew over uh, many sensitive areas like army camps and even over the heritage sites and as a result the government of Nepal uh, had to take serious actions because those were restrictive sites for taking even photographs through terrestrial cameras so that's why they released uh, these official directives for flying drones so after the release of these official um, uh, laws and regulations from the government side it was difficult even for someone with a, a good objective of uh, capturing the drone imageries for uh, rapid response and relief activities. So now if anyone wants to fly drones, then they have to take permissions from a couple of different organizations. So it's going to take them like more than a month's time, uh, even if they have some good intentions and uh, they are planning to do some kind of proper activities related with the reconstruction works. So now uh, whenever we go and visit different organizations talking about the benefit of uh, drones and how they can be implemented in their projects, then the sad thing is that uh, the understanding of most of the people is that whenever we go and talk about drones, then they start, they have a picture of this on their mind. So either it's like a military device or they are, the foreign people are coming to Nepal for spying activities. So we are actually trying to change this mindset. So Nepal Flying Lab is an organization which is working to change this mindset of the people and we are doing this by uh, conducting social good projects that is directly related with not just reconstruction but also with different other uh, kind of geospatial mapping activities. So we are doing this by uh, making use of drones in multiple sectors, not just geospatial mapping, but we are also doing a uh, pilot study with uh, delivery of medicines in the rural areas. And from our past project, uh, we have learned a couple of few things uh, that has helped us uh, like uh, develop our understanding of uh, the use of drone data in geospatial mapping uh, sector. So, uh, if you look at this image, then this image uh, shows the different categories of building damage after Nepal earthquake. So, there are different uh, colored dots and they show the level of damage of the buildings after the Nepal earthquake. And what we are doing is, uh, we are working, we are partnering with the local NGOs and we are capturing high resolution imageries. And by looking at the imageries, you can uh, not just look at the damage level, but also you can remotely monitor the reconstruction activities. So, in the context of Nepal, like lots of uh, organizations, they have their program in the remote areas. So during monsoon, it's quite difficult to get there and uh, look over the program activities. So if you fly a drone, then you, you would be able to uh, draw decisions like this and also monitor your project progress uh, remotely by sitting at the office. And another work is we are also trying to make use of drones in uh, hazard and vulnerability mapping. So after Nepal earthquake, we were shocked to see that uh, statistics. There were 20,000 landslides within 30,000 square kilometer area. So that was a huge number of landslides. So even the communities which were not affected by the earthquake, they had a risk of uh, because of the landslides. So this kind of uh, hazards and vulnerability needs to be accessed. So what we did was uh, uh, we flew drones over there at, at some of those communities and we created high resolution uh, three dimensional maps of those areas. And 
we also partnered with other agencies and then we established, we installed some uh, uh, earthquake, some landslide, uh, the ground movement sensors on that areas so that it can be used as an early warning system in case of like mass movement of land in that area. So these are some of the examples of how we are using drones. Similarly, uh, relating the usage of drone with mapping and OSM activities. So these are some of the maps that we have prepared of some communities. This is one of the map in, of uh, Bhimtar area in Sindhu Palsok. So the community at Bhimtar was planning to do the reconstruction activities and together with an NGO, we prepared a map like this and then we had a meeting in front of the community people and then the community people were able to prepare a map like that. The map on the right side was a map that was uh, prepared after a discussion with the community. So the drone maps, they also provide a better perspective because they are of higher resolution. So that was one example. And similarly, we are also doing other kind of mapping activities um, uh, and the outputs are the higher resolution maps partnering with multiple different agencies. And all of these projects outputs are shared with the government so that we can like gain a trust and also continue our projects in other areas. So talking about uh, like integration of uh, drone imageries into OpenStreet map, there are a couple of different benefits of integrating the imageries from drones into an OpenStreet map. And we have identified uh, four of such uh, benefits that we can get. The first one is high resolution imageries. In my earlier presentation, Sashi sir was uh, like, has mentioned that one of the limitation of using uh, OpenStreetMap in terms of accuracy is that the images in the background, they are of like quite uh, lower resolution. So if you replace it by a higher resolution map, then you can get more accurate outputs out of that. So that is one of the advantages. And another one is quickly deployable. Like if there is a flood, then uh, you don't need to wait like one or two days to get updated satellite image. You just can go there and then uh, collect the imageries and you can import that imageries into OSM as a base map layer and you can start digitizing over it. So you can also get like the technology is quickly deployable. And the third, um, third major benefit was that it's a low cost solution. So like you don't need to worry about spending and getting support from another another big agencies because you can do it on your own by just spending like $2,000. Uh, and the, the thing that has made this technology much more uh, growing and expand, expanding in the recent time is that it is easy and very easy to operate this kind of technologies. So you don't need to be a master, you don't need to be a pilot uh, uh, to in order to handle these kind of tools but like with simple trainings you can conduct aerial mapping with this kind of tools. So these are the four major uh, benefits that we like uh, discovered after doing a couple of different projects with different partners. And uh, this is the workflow model, like this is like a simple kind of a workflow that we have developed on how we can integrate drones into OSM. So the first thing is you have to do a simple flight plan uh, using freely available software, they are open source software as well. And then you can capture the imageries and prepare both 2D as well as 3 dimensional map. So uh, in the previous presentation uh, from practical action, like they used flood uh, modeling as well as open street map. So in such cases, if you have used like 3 dimensional maps from drones, then the flood modeling would have been more accurate. So that kind of um, outputs can also be linked while doing a normal kind of mapping with OSM. And uh, also the quality of the output map can be enhanced. So in uh, during earlier presentation, there were questions about like quality of outputs uh, from the OSM images. So if we replace it by like the higher resolution images in the back end and trace the objects, then the quality can also be enhanced. So that is also another uh, kind of advantage. And there were some examples, uh, example work that I found uh, by, that, was, that has been done by some other organizations where they were like replacing the background imagery at some of the cases and using uh, drone maps uh, to trace and digitize the objects. And I would like to take a quote out from there. Uh, so the objects we are getting out from a OSM map is really as good as imagery we are giving in. So if we enhance the accuracy of the imagery, then obviously the output should also be more accurate. So as I mentioned before, like we can get accurate maps and accurate digitized data sets and also uh, like disaster risk reduction planning can be done more accurately. So you can, when you have a higher resolution map, then you can do an exact estimate of all the losses and also an exact estimate of different parameters that are required for analysis. So that all can be done and these are the major benefits by for using uh, drones in OSM. So I am at the, almost, this is my second last slide and I often can, I often uh, keep this slide in my ending presentation because this is a very interesting statistics. Uh, there were less than 50 internet users in Nepal back in 1995, but now the internet users, uh, according to the statistics of 2016, it has grown to 2.51 million. 
that means like the technology is growing at an exponential rate we just have to make sure that we engage the local communities innovate and make effective use of all these technologies thank you uh, so with this presentation i think we are with uh, good with timing as well so i'd like to open the floor for question and and thank you for the wonderful presentation and very timely presentation. I don't have to stop any of you. Hello? Hello? Okay. I'd like to pass. Is there anyone? So we'll take three questions and if we have some more time then we'll see if we can add some of the questions. And uh, please clearly mention the uh, person's name and if if you don't know, you can just point as well. Hold on, let me find the name. Uh, do you think that? Yes, cool. Um, I'm wondering for your organization, do you have a target of an amount of data that you would want to democratize or open to the public? Like, is there a, like, how do you gauge your progress and what's kind of your end goal? Hi, this is a general for the whole panel. Um, when you're working with local communities and people not really familiar with, you know, mapping or what mapping looks like in this way, how do you do the training? Like, what is the, what is that process like? One more question. Okay, thank you for the questions. Uh, uh, so what we are doing in our organization is that we are not generating the data, uh, but what we are doing is that <coughs> we are reusing the uh, government data uh, for better storytelling, for better use. Uh, since in Nepal, uh, uh, most of the government data are published in this closed format and are not easily accessible. But what we are doing through our project is like we are taking those data and <coughs> doing all this analysis and uh, publishing it in, in machine readable format or easily understandable format. Uh, in all, in open all level, we do not generate data uh, most of the time. And regarding the training, uh, since uh, since we are the international organization, uh, since we have different uh, working groups in different countries, uh, <coughs> we have this pretty structured format for the school of data and other collaborative organization. Uh, so we have been um, doing pretty good with this training also regarding this how to use technology. Uh, for data extraction or cleaning or visualizing kinds of things. So yeah, as, as an international organization, we, have, we, we never had faced this problem regarding the training. Thank you, that's all. Yeah, uh, I think I'll take the second question. So I think uh, working with communities and, and engaging with local NGOs has been a really interesting experience because uh, we, we come from a school of thought where you know we're using all these high-tech uh, GIS, OpenStreetMaps, JOSM, and taking it down to uh, colleagues who really don't understand or they don't have training in JOSM, OSM, so forth and so on. Uh, initially, to be really honest, from a personal perspective, I thought it's, it's impossible to sort of, you know, get this uh, technical message across. But then uh, what we realized is, I guess, it takes a series of training and sort of, again, uh, going back to colleagues and sort of speaking to them, you know, what problems they face when they were sort of doing uh, you know, validation work on the ground. I think that's been a very refreshing experience. But I guess this only answers the question of uh, working together with colleagues at the local NGO. And I guess via the local uh, NGO, we sort of engage with the communities. For example, uh, like in the next month or so, we want to sort of take our maps and sort of engage with the local communities and sort of ask them if these maps make sense to them and if there are certain features they would like to see added. And I think then the question is, were the local communities really involved in making the maps? And I think uh, to answer that, I would say like in, in the communities with whom we work, I guess the literacy rate and also sort of educational 
uh, I would say penetration is, is a bit limited. So I guess we, we again rely back uh, to our local NGO, but I guess it's a start. And, and, I, and I think what we're doing is we're learning by, by sort of doing things. Is there anything from the audience? Or the participant? Okay. Hi there, I'm Vikas from Robotics Association of Nepal. I would like to appreciate the work done by Nepal Flying Labs from Motom side. Uh, since the Nepal is like getting divided into seven different provinces, I would like to know what are the plan of Nepal Flying Labs for these seven different provinces using the drones for open street map. Uh, thank you, Bigasi, for the question. I think, uh, so we'll be happy to uh, work together with all different, uh, this Eastern Province government if we are provided with an opportunity. But currently the uh, future plan of Nepal Flying Lab is that we want to build the capacity of uh, robotics uh, students and professionals at all the different provinces so that they can take forward this technology by themselves. And talking about uh, our our uh, possible collaboration with the local government. Like we have been trying our best to uh, convince uh, the disaster response center at home ministry and at local uh, uh, ministry of local development. And so the, in, order to be, in order to build a kind of a um, rapid response disaster team at each of these uh, like seven provinces. And uh, when they build this kind of like rapid response team in all of these provinces, then we will be like very interested in providing them all the equipments necessary uh, for them so that they can uh, do better disaster response. So from our side we are very much willing to work together but it all depends upon uh, their response as well. Thank you. Any other question? The last. Hi, I really enjoyed the presentation about mapping Kirby tour and I have a question about uh, your choice of uh, IT editor over Jossom. Um, has this to do with the challenge you mentioned um, of retaining mappers for long term? Uh, is the choice of IT over Jossom because of the need to train new mappers and all that? Uh, you mean like uh, Jossom training the mappers? Jossom and IT? Uh, you mentioned that yeah. you later you decided that ID editor was better for you. Yeah, first we we tried Justin first and later on ID. And because uh, we found that uh, most of the participants in our mapping parties, they were, uh, they don't have background of geography or other things. They are, they, they are very used, they are active in social media. And we feel that Joseph is like for more it need more technical background or all thing and Josom's you know it's a more user friendly uh, sorry ID is more user friendly friendly than Josom and you don't have to download other desktop software again you just uh, need a browser and just just you know uh, just map it so Josom map we need an additional installation sometimes sometimes some machines doesn't have Java and some machine doesn't have other add-ons so it have you know a lot of problem while doing. Um, you know, mapping party with Jossum. So we move, later on we move with ID. So that's the reason. Uh, thank you. I think it's a. Okay. Uh, I'd like to um, ask one question to Yogeshi. Um, actually, I'm so much embedded with the volunteerism and I really appreciate the volunteering work that's going around. So, um, can you share us um, some of the tips? I think most of us are uh, open street mappers or contributors, um, and would like to know what actually inspired you to map on OSM, and how do you manage your time from other things you do every day? Thank you for the question. Uh, actually, our motivation starts uh, as like Sushi shared us that. Uh, our town is uh, unvisible, uh, like uh, uh, we have the famous places, uh, but, uh, but uh, Google images are unclear. So we decided to move on uh, OSM to fulfill our, uh, that our town is also a quite unique place and we have to put uh, some information on that OSM. That is the mon uh, most uh, inspiring things. And uh, later on uh, for that uh, OSM, uh, mapping parties 
Uh, basically, I am from the uh, physics teacher background. My physics, my background is in physics teaching. So uh, uh, we generally do at the evening time uh, and the uh, Saturday, Saturday morning or the Saturday evening. So we generally do the uh, first. Uh, we will uh, round about uh, tour some 20 minutes and uh, start the details. Uh, then after uh, we put on the ID. Then after the uh, uh, few months later, we validate that data. Uh, from this uh, process, we have done lots of things. Thank you. With this note, I would like to conclude the session. Thank you very much for uh, listening to us, and thank you for your wonderful story. Thank you.